All right. Well, I'm gonna get the ball rolling here this morning. So welcome everyone. Happy Sunday. It's a snowy, cozy morning. Well, I hope you all are cozy because it's cold out there. Um, we are continuing in our Christian formation class, our ongoing Christian formation class, race, whiteness, and the church. And as we've mentioned, the goals for this series are to understand more about the history of race and the experience of being black in America, to discuss the concept of institutional racism, to understand more about how the sin of racism has impacted the church, the health and the unity and the witness of the church, uh, and to explore how we can be at grace, a healing community in the midst of all that. We're really excited to have a guest speaker joining us, and I'm going to pass the mic to John, who is going to introduce our guest for today. Uh, thank you, Drew. Um, uh, it's been said that the kingdom of God grows when we introduce our friends to our friends, and um, that's what I'm really excited about doing today. Um, Greg Thompson is on this call. He is a, a dear friend of mine and has been so since the 90s. Uh, Clinton was in the White House when he and I <laughs> met each other. So, uh, uh, and it, he is a, if you read the bio, he is a man of many talents and passions, uh, pastor, writer, musician, uh, artist, uh, nonprofit director, done so many things. And he is a, uh, there's a forthcoming book on reparations that he co-authored with a guy by the name of Duke Kwan, who's a, a pastor in Washington, D.C. Uh, so, Greg, it is a, just a great privilege to have you here. Um, you may notice if he drinks from time to time, he's got a Victrola coffee mug um, yeah. that uh, from Seattle. So he's, he's, he's rep in Seattle this morning. Uh, so, Greg, welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here today. Thanks. Thanks. It's good to see everybody. Thanks for taking time to, um, to be on this, on this call with me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share, um, I'm going to share a screen that's going to have some photos and I'm just going to kind of walk you through, um, some initial thoughts, give you some context for who I am and what I'm doing. Um, and so we'll just, we'll just start that now. So this is where I live. I live in Charlottesville, Virginia. This is about a three minute walk from my house. What, what you're looking at right now. This is, um, this is the university, um, design founded by Thomas Jefferson. Um, and it, you know, uh, it's a, it's a remarkable place. I've spent, spent 20 something years here. And, um, it's, this is the town that's formed my family and formed my community. Um, and when you, if you ever heard of Charlottesville, which I imagine some of you have, uh, you've heard of it either for this or you've heard of it for this. Um, this is the same place. And you, you can kind of ask yourself, how is it that a, that a place that is so, you know, known for Jeffersonian legacy for this, like, for this kind of liberal imagination, um, enlightenment imagination is also the locus for this, um, and the fact is that this is not an anomaly, what you're looking at on the screen, but this is actually fundamental. Um, and the reason is, is this. Um, it's one of my favorite paintings. It's Thomas Jefferson portrait with uh, an enslaved woman behind him. Um, and this is deeply embedded into the entire history of this community that, that I live and work in. I'm going to go back to the first slide for just a moment. I want to show you a couple of things. When lots of people look at this, they say this, they see this beautiful, what Thomas Jefferson called academical village, um, you know, and, and in these, these houses right here, those were, that's where faculty live um, and the rooms in between are where students live. And behind them, you'll see there are these big, these beautiful colonial gardens. Uh, I walk those gardens every day. Um, but what most people don't understand is that this is designed as a massive plantation that this is this this is the center of the plantation and that each of these houses were where faculty lived but in these gardens this is where these are where enslaved people lived and worked um and there were over 900 enslaved people here at a given time and so this is this is part of the jeffersonian legacy uh, and if you want to really understand this and, and this is kind of an introduction to the to the work that I'm doing, I want to take you to the cemetery. So when you go into the cemetery of the University of Virginia, this is what you see. 
there are three sections to it. This is a Confederate. This is it's called the Confederate Dead. Um, and it says there, fate denied them victory, but crowned them with glorious immortality. Um, this, this is a part of a memorialization process that happened in the United States largely from the 1890s to the 1920s. Um, and these, uh, these boys that were buried in this graveyard um, were all Civil War soldiers that died at the University Hospital. They were not students at the University of Virginia of necessity. They were people who died in Charlottesville um, as related to, to battles in the surrounding area. This is what it looks like. Again, I walk here every day. Um, and um, this kind of artfully manicured, beautiful um, trees uh, sheltering these graves. Then you walk through a stone wall, uh, opening in a stone wall, and you come to the original section of the cemetery that was built in the 1820s by um, an African-American, enslaved African-American man named um, Zebra um, and uh, a co-worker. They uh, quarried all the stone. They hauled it to the field. They shaped it. They built the walls that are still there. And this this cemetery really holds the the bodies of the kind of Charlottesville famous people, you know, Thomas Jefferson's friends, the people who built arts and sciences in the United States, especially in the South. Um, some of you have heard of the McGuffey School or McGuffey Reader. That all came out of the University of Virginia. So this is this is this cemetery. It's a beautiful place, um, kind of quintessentially Southern in a certain kind of aesthetic. Um, there's also dogs that are buried here. So this is one from 1939 from the class of um, the University of Virginia, the memory of Beta. There's another one that I didn't show that was buried in the 50s. Um, so it's kind of a center of what is sacred for the university. Um, and this is, you know, again, this is what it looks like. Beautiful. Now you see that dogwood over there on the right? See that, that white tree? There's a wall that you can see kind of in the left middle of your screen. If you walk up, walk up toward that wall, you turn right past that big bush right there toward the dogwood. And you walk, this is what you see. You walk into this. And if I walk toward that fence, right, that, that wooden fence, and then turn around and look back toward the cemetery, this is what you see. Now, you wouldn't know this, but this is actually the third part of the cemetery. And this is the African-American burial ground. Um, it was discovered on accident in 2012 um, while they were doing an environmental study for an expansion uh, for the dorms that are nearby. And they realized that there are 67 grave shafts in this field. And then they found a note um, from the 1890s. Some librarian found a note that, that signified that this was, this was this, the burial ground for enslaved people. Um, and what you're looking at, that wall right there, is literally the color line in American culture. Because um, if you look on the other side of the wall, where white folks are, what you see is flowers and trees um, and memorials. And if you look on this side of the wall, where I'm standing, you don't see anything except grass. Um, and that is, that is really by design. Um, I want you just to keep that image in your mind for a little bit. Um, when I was, and I was a, was a PCA pastor for 20 years, um, senior pastor of a church in Charlottesville and, and did my PhD at UVA on MLK, which meant that to understand the antecedents of MLK, I spent a lot of time, 10 years reading African-American cultural and intellectual history and um, became eventually convinced. I mean, I, I, I talked a lot about culture, Christianity and culture and pluralism and secularization and globalization and these kind of things, which are real and they matter. But over the course of that 10 years, I basically became convinced that the American church's sheltering of racism and white supremacy was the kind of greatest missionary threat uh, to, to the integrity of Christianity in this culture. I became convinced of that. And then that led me to this sort of, this I wouldn't call it a crisis, but a clarification that, that eventuated in a series of, of many crises <laughs> following. Um, and it, it was that my, my question at, is, as a Christian pastor and a Christian missionary, um, not just in a, quote, post-Christian culture, but um, in, a, in, a, in a, one of the longest standing white supremacist cultures in the history of the world, um, my question is, it became, what am I to do about this legacy of racism in our midst? That, what, what, what am I supposed to do about this? And as I explored this question, I found myself on both sides of this color line. And I noticed that when I was with um, 
with with white folk, especially Christian Christian folk, um, the language largely centered around reconciliation, um, and it centered. It, it also depended on how like woke they were, um, or or like culturally progressive they were. It also talked about they talked about institutional reform in some ways. You know, maybe reforming the criminal justice system, things like that. Um, and I, I noticed that, and some of you are probably very familiar with that. But when I was in African American communities in Memphis and Chicago and DC, where I spend most of my time, um, they were talking about something very different than that. They were talking about the, the language used was reparations. And I realized that that was almost never used in the white communities that I was a part of. And that gap felt really important to me. And so I asked my friend Duke Kwan, who I, who I knew gave a, who I heard give a lecture on reparations, if he would be interested in trying to write something on this, on this gap um, and fill in the gap really by writing a book on reparations. And so this is the book, it comes out in about seven weeks. Um, it's called Reparations, A Christian Call for Repentance and Repair. Um, and what I wanna do briefly is, is walk you through some of the structure of the argument um, of, the, of the story that we tell. And then um, I want to give you some examples of how we're, I'm trying to, what I do with my, how I'm working this out vocationally. Because people, people ask me, like, what do you do? Depending on who they are, um, you know, I answer in different ways. But what I'm actually doing is reparations. Like, that's, that's what my work is. Um, and I understand that. And so, um, so I just want to walk through this briefly. So I realized that, that what you think we ought to do about American racism depends on what your, you think of our view of what your view of racism is. So for example, if you think racism is fundamentally personal prejudice, then what you're gonna focus on is personal repentance, right? Um, or, and, and I, I was telling these guys earlier, I, I made a slideshow for this, but then forgot my Google password and got locked out of my Google Drive because I tried to log in too many times. So I had to remake it with like screenshots. So here it is, this, this isn't super high tech, but this will do. Um, uh, but if you think if you think that racism is relational estrangement, then what you're going to do is talk about racial reconciliation. This will be indicative of like a lot of the work, of, say, the Promise Keepers movement or the racial reconciliation movement in the in the evangelicals, from, you know, in the 1880s, sorry, 1980s and 1990s. Um, if you think it's an institutional justice, then you're going to think about institutional reform. So think about criminal justice reform in this way. All those are true and all those are important, but never, none of them actually get you to reparations. And I realize that the reparations argument is predicated upon a different view of racism. And that is um, that it's a cultural disorder. It's, it's a broken cultural order that needs to be repaired. Um, and it's not until you understand that this is an entire cultural system. It's not just a series of discrete institutions, but that it's an entire cultural system that has very important consequences uh, on the lives of, of uh, people who are black and brown that you'll, you, won't, you won't think about reparations really seriously until you understand that. So this is, this is kind of chapter one, helping people understand these different views of racism. Now, the, um, when we began to talk about reparations, um, I realized that and I started reading about it, I recognized that um, most people were talking about context that the reparations against the backdrop of slavery, which is a very discreet thing that happened in, in time, you know, for hundreds of years, but it's a very particular kind of thing and it's, it's very time bound. So um, if you read, if you read reparations literature, what you find is that it's, there's a lot of conversation about who was, whose um, ancestors were enslaved, where, for how long. And part of the reason the reparations conversation has not got, gotten a lot of traction is because that's a very, very difficult thing to document by the nature of the case. And so there's a lot of confusion about this and, and multiple reparations organizations that are, that are talking about this. Um, but if you, if you give it, if you set reparations against the backdrop, not of slavery, but of white supremacy, then what that allows you to do is talk about it in more comprehensive terms. Um, Cause it's not just one specific institution. It's a constellation of institutions that are in a cultural system. And it's not just time bound from say, you know, 1619 to 1863. It's actually this enduring model um, that tells it gives a much more comprehensive picture. So, um, but then, then I realized as I began to think about that, that when I would talk about white supremacy, everybody asked me to like use different words. Not everybody, white folks asked me to do use different words than that. Um, and so is it, I agree with you, but can you say it in a different way? The answer is no, um, because what we wanted to do was say, we're, we're going to talk about white supremacy as real. And so there's a chapter, this is chapter two, 
where I basically, it's called Seeing White Supremacy, where I talk about whiteness as a modern invention and try to tell the story of where this notion of whiteness came from and how it emerged. Um, and to show that it's, that it had a political function. Whiteness is a modern invention with a political function and that political function is supremacy. It is political, economic, um, institutional, cultural supremacy of people who that America deems to be white. Um, so this is why it's been so important to talk about white supremacy. And one of the things we say incidentally in the book is that the goal of the book is to, is to put the language of white supremacy and reparations in Christian mouths and make that language as familiar as race and racial reconciliation are right now. Um, we know that white supremacy and reparations are not familiar language for a lot of folks, but our prayer is that it will be. So that's the, the reality of white supremacy. Then we want to talk about the effects of white supremacy. Okay, if, if whiteness is a modern invention with a political function, what have its effects been? And, um, and to understand that, we, we essentially define white supremacy as a, as a massive multi-generational form of cultural theft. Um, that's been, now, uh, as we say in the book, white supremacy is actually a symphony of vices, but um, it's, it's, originating, it's originating desire. Um, it's actual literal ex social expression, the theft of human beings. Um, and it's, a, it's ongoing effect really is, is taking things that belong to others. Um, and so what we then try to do is say, all right, well, what kind of theft is? So we talked about theft of truth. Think about the cemetery again. Um, theft of truth happens in American culture in a couple of ways. I mean, it, told, it stole the truth about what it means to be a human being um, through lies that it told about both white folks and African-American folks and others. Um, but it also told the truth, theft, stole the truth about history through romanticization. So think about the Confederate memorial, you know, fate denied them victory, but crowned them with glorious immortality. Okay. Uh, that, that's just, that's just like romanticization and, and erasure is the other thing where as I began to look at this and realize the history of memorialization, that the landscape is basically enshrining white supremacy because of the stories that we have put inside of memorials. And so it's, in one, in one respect, white supremacy is the theft of truth through romanticization and erasure. In another respect, it's the theft of power. Um, personal power, when we talk about the, the stealing of bodies and the captivity of minds, what, um, you know, MLK uses this language of the, the enslavement of the mind. Um, and, but yet also political and institutional power. And we tell the history of how African-Americans have been, uh, especially with respect to the vote, as is also happening now, um, uh, where have been denied this, this, uh, the franchise as an exercise of political power. And so it's stolen, white supremacy has been an explicit theft of truth, explicit theft of power, and also a theft of wealth. But most people, when they think about reparations, they think about it against a purely economic background. Um, it's not, it's not just that, um, and newer literature is starting to grapple with the comprehensiveness of how we ought to talk about reparations. And this book really seeks to push that forward. We talk about wealth though, um, as extraction of wealth. Um, you probably know this, that in the 1850s, the largest con con concentration of millionaires anywhere in the world was in the Mississippi Delta. Just think about that. <laughs> uh, anywhere in the world in America in the 1860s. And I want you to think about the standard of living in the United States in the 18, 1830s to 1860s, okay, not high. The highest concentration of millionaires in the world is in the Mississippi Delta. So there's this extraction of wealth from African-American labor. Um, and then there's this obstruction of wealth where we tell stories about land theft on the South Carolina coast. John is from, from South Carolina, not far from the coast. My eye also am from South Carolina. Um, and if you have friends who have beach houses on the South Carolina coast, that land almost invariably is land that was stolen by the government from African-American families to whom it had originally given that, that land in the 1860s. Um, and, um, but also, you probably know that the Freedmen's Bank, the United States, uh, the only time the United States has ever started a bank was in the 1860s. Um, and it was a bank for African-Americans so that they could save money towards home ownership. Um, and, but it was run by white Wall Streeters. It was supposed to be a savings and loan bank, but without telling their, their account holders, they made it into a, um, an investment bank and lost. And in the crash of 1873, 50% of black wealth in America vanished. And the federal government refused to back the bank. So that money was just lost. Um, these are just some examples of how uh, 
with the, the, the attempt to, of African-American communities to grow wealth has been deliberately obstructed, not to mention the New Deal and, and, and Homestead Act and redlining and any other thing, so we, which we can talk about. Now, as a Christian, I'm interested in the, in the role of the church in this. And, um, and the fact is that the church has a complex witness, okay? On the one hand, the church has been a perpetrator of this. Um, we, as Willie James Jennings, I don't know if y'all know the book, The Christian Imagination, Willie James Jennings' book, if you don't, I think it's, I honestly think it's probably the most important book written on race in the, in the past 50 years. Uh, it's, it's foundational to all this, but we, the, the Christian church in the West has perpetrated this, justified it, accepted it, benefited from it. Um, we, we sacralized it, baptized it. Um, and that's just, that's just a fact. Um, and so on the other hand, um, the church has also functioned as a liberator. Um, not there's been this, of course, in the African American church and minority and immigrant churches, but also in abolitionist kind of context, um, where people have from the beginning really struggled to name, to resist, and to repair the the world from the harms of white supremacy. So the church has a complex witness, and that complex witness is actually continuing to play out in our own in our own kind of cultural context right now. We need to understand that the churches are not at any point ever ever neutral on this subject. Um, they're, they're one or the other in these things. And I think that's important. And so as I looked into the site, like, okay, what does Christianity have to say about this? Um, and happily, if you frame white supremacy as theft, Christianity has a lot to say about that. We, in fact, have a whole ethical tradition about that. And we try to elucidate two elements of that, of that, that ethic. The first is for the culpable. If you are culpable of theft, then the Christian ethic is restitution. Okay, you give back what you stole. And that really is, is, is seen in the Zacchaeus narrative um, where, you know, he, he says, I'm going to give back um, four times what I stole and I'm going to ha give half my possessions to the poor. He's not just having like, a, you know, Jim Wallace freak out right there. Okay, He didn't just go like, so, this isn't like a spasm of white guilt. This, he's actually quoting the book of Numbers. So he, this, is a, this is a Hebraic ethic that he is using here that, that he's now embodying and identifying himself as a part of the, the people of Jesus. Hey, can you hold on just one second? My kid's yelling at me and he doesn't know I'm on this computer. Hold on. And we're back. Let me uh, let me get back to the to the uh, the slides here. My bad. My little dude. He's such a sweetheart. He's, he was playing. A, I think he's playing a video game or something and absolutely losing his mind. Um, so let me go back to where we are here. Uh, it's going. I've got to pull these photos up again. This is great. I think you were on Zacchaeus, by the way, if that was. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's what should pull up. All right. Awesome. Yeah. So um, this is the, there, there, there are two really important Christian responses to theft. One is if you're culpable, the ethic of restitution and Zacchaeus becomes a really useful um, heuristic for understanding that. But the other is, is what we say when you come across, it's, it's, we call this the ethic of restita, restita, restoration. When you come across a theft in which you're not complicit, you're still called to, to act redemptively and responsibly. And that really is the Good Samaritan story. It's, it's important to understand that, that this ethic of love, neighbor love that Jesus talks about is fundamentally embedded um, in, this, in a story about theft. And so what you see is that Zacchaeus and the Samaritan essentially do the same thing. They restore the person to wholeness. Um, but there, so there are these two parts of, of the Christian response to theft. And so as we talk about reparations, we basically say that it's, you know, reparations in Christian theology is for the culpable an act of restitution. Um, and for uh, the non-culpable, it's a calling to act restoratively, that have, and both of which, the goal of which is to restore the wrong to wholeness um, in, in every way. And so... Um, that, that then led to this question, okay, then what's the shape of, rest, of reparations? And so we have these, this threefold work of reparations. Um, uh, and this is, this is essentially chapter seven now. Um, 
and um, the, the closing chapter where we think reparations of truth is really fundamental. And that re that requires us to both like name the lies and renounce them, uh, but also to tell the truth. And that truth takes shape in all kinds of ways, you know, through memorialization, through public statements, through um, through literature, through art, all these kind of things. And so the reparations of truth is a really fundamental place. And in, in fact, that's where I'm mostly spending my work now. Repair of power, um, where you enable local agency. It's not like that you're conferring agency, but you are removing obstacles to, to the agency of African-Americans um, and, and creating spaces um, for that agency to, to flourish. Um, and then the really practicing submission. I think that that part of this, part of the work here is to, is to come uh, be beneath African-American leaders, leaders and promote their institutional leadership as a fundamental act of reparations. Um, and so that seems that's, we can talk more about that. Then repair of wealth, obviously, um, I think that there are debts that are owed um, and that we all, that need to be paid and also removing barriers are, from wealth. And there, there are lots of ways that that can happen uh, through investment funds and in minority owned businesses, through enabling, um, through cancellation of school debt, through, you know, through the ways that um, mortgages can be subsidized and all, all these things that we talk a lot about this in chapter seven. I'm not going to go into all the details, but when we talk about the work of reparations, it's framed out in these three ways. Um, and so basically one of the most important things to understand is that our book situates um, reparations, not simply against the backdrop of white supremacy, but it, it situates it against the backdrop, not of the federal government, but against the local church and local communities. Um, part of the reason for that is that we, bo we both believe that the federal government has a responsibility for this. And you probably know there have been three times in American history when the federal government has in fact paid reparations, um, you know, obviously to people who were interned in, in your part of the country, um, during the, the to the Japanese that were in turn um, to slave owners after emancipation, um, and then uh, and to Pacific Islanders as a result of some of our nuclear tests that where we completely destroyed their communities um, and and killed lots and lots of people um, with blood disorders as a result of nuclear tests and proximity. So we have this political, if we have the political will, we have, we know how to do it. And we actually have forced other countries to play, pay reparations to each other, <laughs> but we haven't done that here. Um, and so I think the Christian community can actually help our communities heal from these ravages of white supremacy. If we took up the responsibility for the work of reparations, nobody thinks we're gonna do that. Um, but if we said, this is, this is where we're going. And I personally do think public discourse is headed in this direction. Um, I think especially with the with the most recent election, I think it's very probable that um, H.R. 40, you know, which has been going to Congress for 40 for 30 years to, to ask for a study committee on reparations will be passed. Um, and and it, if not, it will probably happen by executive order. So I think churches ought to be working out on the ground what reparations looks like. And, and we can talk about what that would mean. Now, what I, what I want to do is I want to tell you what it's looking like for me. Because people, including my mother-in-law, say, like, what do you do again? Uh, here's, here's what I do. I basically work in the reparations of truth world, and I'll give you some examples. Okay, so this is Claiborne Temple. This is in Memphis, Tennessee. Some of y'all may have been to Memphis. Um, and um, this is a site of the sanitation worker strike of 1968. You see that, or you've probably seen that sign before. I've got one of those behind me right now. Um, and whenever you see that sign, that's Memphis. That's MLK's last march where he was murdered in, in, um, in April 1968. One of my favorite photographs um, of the civil rights movement. This is taken in March of 1968 by a photographer named Ernest Withers, um, if you uh, want to look him up. Um, well, and this, this is incredibly contemporary relevant. I uh, have contemporary relevance. This young man right here in the white shirt, Larry Payne, he was 16 years old. About five minutes after this photograph, he was shot at point blank range by this police officer with a shotgun. Um, this police officer followed him back to his apartment um, and killed him. Um, and he, his funeral, Larry's, Larry Payne's funeral was at Claiborne Temple. When I got involved in Claiborne Temple in 2016, it looked like this. It was about to be torn down. It was um, condemned by the city. Um, it's right next door to the NBA arena. Um, so the, there are people who had obvious reasons to want to buy this real estate and tear this down. Um, but some people came together and said, no, we're not doing that. Um, bought it. And I started help leading a process of restoration. Um, this is 
this is again a close up mold everywhere everything just rotted out um so we basically first thing we did was like a basic structural restoration you know you see this big this big column back here that was put in by Second Presbyterian Church, the church that had actually a white church that had initially owned this building and then left it when black people started moving in the neighborhood and moved out into the suburbs. So they have stabilized this new floor. Um, the building is now closed because we've raised like $5 million for renovations and that's gonna happen over the next couple of years. But in addition to doing that, um, well, I love this. There was a, there's an EPC church that's been meeting in this space. Um, uh, kind of a multi-ethnic church, in downtown Memphis. Um, people have weddings there, et cetera. So I, I moved to Memphis and worked, I worked here in this space for two years, um, until I moved back to Charlottesville and now I'm just doing it remotely, but we realized we wanted to not just restore the building, but also restore, but also promote the story. Um, and this is what we call San, I am a man Plaza. This was commissioned um, and uh, opened in on in April of 1968, the 50th anniversary of King's assassination. This is it. That's the the words on there. King's last speech. Um, uh, the other side is as um, bronze. This is um, this is stainless steel. So when you look in it, it's very polished. You see your own reflection in that, and the reflection of people around you. It's pretty cool. Um, it lights up at night, which I, I love that, that feature. And, um, this is a, this is a great, I love this image of it. Um, the wall that you see in the back is the name of all names of all the sanitation workers There were 1300 of them. So the, the, this is part of the reparations of truth because now in the kind of poorest neighborhood in Memphis, this memorial to the Imago Dei is there. Um, and that, that's what we were trying to do was build this memorial to the, truthfulness of their of african-american beauty and personhood in a neighborhood that essentially belies that um and in a city that has neglected that even though that city is 70 percent black um this, this is an extraordinary place um but then we thought all right well that's all this is only going to help if people come to see this but not a lot of people come to Memphis. I mean, you know, people come for Beale Street or for Elvis or for Ribs or whatever, but they don't come for this story. Um, so I worked with a rapper named Show Baraka. Some of you may know Show and me Show, um, and he and I wrote this musical together. Um, that's it's a Memphis sound, soul and hip hop based, um, uh, and we told the story of the sanitation worker strike. It's called Union the Musical, um, and this is our creative team. Uh, show is on the left. I'm on the right, um, and uh, this is a this. These are people that I've spent an enormous amount of time with over the past three years. Um, the guy in the middle is a dude named Art Hooker. He's a filmmaker. Um, the guy to the left in the hat and sunglasses is the best musician I've ever met. He played with you know Quincy Jones, and he worked on Michael Jackson's Thriller <laughs> when he was like when he was like in his early twenties. He looks he looks like he's in his twenties now, but he's like fifty something. Um, the woman on the le on the left in the scarf was a uh, creative director of a black theater in 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 New York. Now lives in Ghana. The woman in the black dress is Anasa Troutman. She's an executive producer. The guy in the kind of goldish pants is Justin Merrick. He was on Broadway, um, Masters in Opera. He's the music director of the of the play. Um, and so this is the team that is working on telling the story. This is a performance. One of the performances we did, and this is in Winston Salem. Um, and those those are my my fellas right there. Uh, these are all Memphis-based actors, some of whom are working two and three jobs to 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 make it in this city. Um, incredibly talented. Um, and so, yeah, this is this is kind of a grainy photo, so I'll skip. Um, but this is them after after the the Memphis performance. So part of the goal here was to say, how do we tell this story that people don't know and take it on the road? We had three shows that were canceled because of COVID. And we're trying to figure out how to get back on the road in 2022. Um, so then um, I got pulled into, that was in Memphis, but this other project called um, Voices, I, we started an organization called Voices Underground. It's in Pennsylvania, Chester County, Pennsylvania. I'm not going to bore you too much with this right now, but it's essentially the home of, of America's first two black colleges, Lincoln and Cheney, um, both of which were founded in the 1850s. Um, huge free black communities. It's just across the border from Delaware, which was a slave state. Um, and Pennsylvania was the line to freedom. And so just what would happen is people would on the Underground Railroad would flee up the East Coast and then come rather than going straight to Philadelphia because there were too many slave catchers because of this pernicious slave, Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. 
they would go west into Chester County, Pennsylvania, and then be kind of smuggled over by Quakers. Um, but there's no memorialization in that space. There's no memorialization. It's the, it's the epicenter of America's first civil rights movement. And you wouldn't know it. You just think, oh, this is where you'll probably know the painter Andrew Wyeth or the DuPont family had an estate there. <clears throat> so you go to Chester County, you think Andrew Wyeth or the DuPonts. There's a place called Longwood Gardens that's in this space. Um, but there's no memorialization to Black cultural history. So we created an organization to tell these stories. Voices Underground really comes from Genesis 4, where Cain says to Abel, I mean, God, God, Cain kills Abel. God says to him, where's your brother? He says, am I my brother's keeper? And then God says, I heard your brother's blood crying out from the ground. That for me is really the first justice passage. And it's like God hearing these voices that are buried through violence and then making them known. So I know we're running out of time, but this is a this is an actual basement of an underground railroad space that um, I visited where these enslaved people would would hide down here and then come up these steps when it was when it was safe to go. So we're we're um, we build a partnership with Lincoln University, the first black college in the United States. Um, and they're and we're helping them tell the story. We're building a memorial. This isn't the one. This is the National Lynching Memorial in Montgomery, but it's of this scale and scope. Um, so we're we're in site assessment right now, and we're we're going to try to procure a site in the next eighteen months. Um, and we've been doing community engagement stuff. This is also fun. We, I decided like, okay, people are coming to, they're gonna to come to this memorial. What's another way we can tell these stories? Um, and I realized that there's a whole history that most of the cocktails that people know that are famous in the United States were uh, many and many of them were invented by formerly enslaved men who went to work at country clubs or city clubs around the United States at post-emancipation, like the mint julep, for example. Um, and so we decided to open a cocktail bar um, uh, underneath an old abolitionist dairy, a dairy that was owned by an abolitionist family. It's just literally underground. Um, and uh, this is our design photo. This isn't the space. It, it does look like this, except our walls are stone. They're 20 foot tall stone walls. I think I'm the stage. Oh, thank you. Um, and um, this, is a, this is another image of the bar design. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, but what we're doing is we're partnering with black artists to, to we're building them. We built the entire menu off of Tom Bullock, who is the, he wrote, um, he's an enslaved, a formerly enslaved man who wrote a book called The Ideal Bartender in 1917. Um, we built it around his menu. We're commissioning black artists to put portraits of African Americans all over the walls. This guy is painting a six foot tall portrait of Harriet Tubman in this style, which is going to be freaking amazing. Because um, I said, what I want is for this to, this to be a, a place where we tell the story of black gorgeousness and black joy and black power. Um, and because that is not a story that people hear enough and I want them to see this. And so uh, this is another one of his, um, which I love. And the, you know this, but these are built off medieval iconography. Um, uh, and so um, then there's a guy uh, named Oliver Sin who lives in San Francisco who is, who is doing these portraits for us. I love that one. Um, this one is, is my favorite. I think this is just completely majestic. Um, and then... Um, then there's a woman named Margaret Bowler in New York who, who paints these very interesting and complicated portraits. Um, so anyway, back to the cemetery and then I'll be done. Um, my work here is about reparations of truth. That's what, that's how I'm spending, spending my time. This was, I took this probably in April. Um, this is me standing in the African American cemetery, looking over into the white cemetery. And I noticed these flowers were everywhere. This is just one of a, an entire wall of these things. Um, but then when I looked on the African American side, this is what was there. Now this is in April of 2020. Um, and that just for me felt so like symbolic of what we're actually facing in America. This is not just a Charlottesville, Virginia problem. This is what is actually happening in every community that I'm aware of, um, where I go and visit and we talk about these. Uh, what's, this, what's the status of African-American cultural memorialization in your community? It's this. Um, and so our family put this there. Um, now UVA campus ministries are, have taken it upon themselves to personally maintain this cemetery. And even in the snow, we've got, you know, probably six inches of snow out here. I went out two days ago and people had, had laid roses. They put roses in the snow where all the grave shafts are. Um, and this is my little man. Um, this was his job in the summer to walk over to the cemetery and, and water this flower. Um, so when I think about, uh, the work that I'm doing or trying to do, it, it really is about reparations. 
I've told you the reasons why I've given you some examples of what it, what it looks like, and I don't know where it's going to lead. Um, but this is, this is really what I feel like the calling with respect to race. I think it's one of the most important things that the church can take up right now to learn to seriously think about and talk about this work of reparations. So I'll leave it there. Well, thank you so much, Greg. And, and I can say for myself, it, this has given me a, a lot to think about and new categories uh, to think about reparations. I love the way that you broke it out into kind of reparations of truth, reparations of power, and reparations of wealth. Uh, and particularly, I think that's great because I think it it can, a lot of times in this subject, even if we want to see reparations, we don't know personally what we can do, you know, what, what our influence can be on some kind of federal government program. Um, but this, I think, gives a lot of traction to what we can do. Um, but I would love to hear from all of you uh, who have uh, joined us today. Uh, this is a great time. We have a little less than 20 minutes now for questions and discussion. So, um, please bring your questions and your thoughts. And while you're thinking about those, um, I just sent you a link uh, to the reparations project, reparationsproject.com. The reason I sent you that is because you can, see, if you wanted to try to get your minds around this a little more, we actually have an excerpt from the book on the, on the website so that you can read the whole introduction of most of the first chapter on the website if you wanted to see it. Sorry. I put it my question in the chat. You mentioned a book really briefly that you said was worth us reading, and I didn't yeah. have a. If would you put that in? The yeah, chat? I'm putting it in. I'm putting it, putting it in right now. Yeah, just to um, kind of connect it, um, Andrew Draper, who spoke with us in November, and also Jason when he spoke a few weeks ago, have all mentioned Willie Jennings, who's an important scholar on these issues. So uh, you, you're hearing that underlined by multiple speakers who have spoken with us. There's nobody, there's nobody doing anything even close to what he's doing in terms of its theological depth and complexity around this subject. It's just completely astonishing how good it is. And he's got a commentary on the book of Acts too, um, which would be very much worth your read. But um, the Christian imagination, it's, um, it's amazing. And actually what he says, and I'm not going to go into it too much, but it, he talks about the that all of this racial stuff that we've experienced coming out of the structure of the, of the white European imagination, it, meaning it's sub-rational, it's subconscious. It's the way the actual imagination is structured, which is why I made the decision to go in the reparations of truth direction, because I thought that this public art and cocktail bars and musicals and things like this would allow me to access the imagination more easily than say direct kind of like political engagement or things like that. Um, so his work is like foundational to how I understand the decisions that I'm making around vocation. All right, questions or thoughts out there? I have a question. Um, thank you for your for your, uh, all this information. I agree with Drew about the categories of reparations. That's helpful for my understanding. I'm interested to know um, like the, the reactions that you've had from the, the church that you pastor or used to pastor or are part of as you uh, as you speak of this, um, because I'm I'm sure I'm having some of those reactions, um, or other people are. Um, your responses to those? Yeah, well, um, you know, I think so. I, I left pastoral ministry formally in 2016, um, and part of that was I knew that I was that I was, you know going in this direction with my vocation, I knew it was going to be a more public art direction. I knew it was going to be more, more public writing about this. And um, I didn't think that I could do that as a senior pastor of a PCA church. Um, in fact, I was sure that I couldn't um, because of not only the obligations of all of the of all of the things that you have to do as a pastor, which you need to do and should do, but also because of the inevitable drama that would just, you know, sort of become um, a riptide. 
Um, and you know, John, can, you can speak more about this and however you want to, but, um, I, I kind of eventually stepped out of pastoral ministry formally in part because of this, because of this reason. So I think what I'm doing, people aren't necessarily coming after me, although that's, that is, that will happen. So there'll be the antagonism, right. And it'll, it'll say like, this is Marxism or this is critical theory, or this is any of the sort of things that we're talking about right now with respect to race, there will, there will be that. Then there will be people who are like, I don't know this, this, I've been inherently nervous about this, but I'd love to talk about it. And I'd love to read the book and discuss it. So there've been people that are open, um, people that are hostile, people that are open. And then there are people, and I, th I think a large number of people is in this third category. That's like, we want to have, we, we need something to lead us beyond the current racial reconciliation impasse. We need people to give us new categories. Can you help us understand what is what this conversation is and so i i actually am deeply encouraged i personally think and i may be wrong on this i personally think that it's going to be people out of quote our communities this 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 white um socially conscious largely white whitish uh socially conscious evangelicalism that are going to lead this conversation i think um, I think, and I actually think that's an opportunity that we have. Um, I could be wrong on that, but I, I'm going to be very surprised if, if it's not people that are in, in the, in the Christian world who are taking on this responsibility. And, and right now there are, I'm already working with three with churches in three different communities who are saying, how can we prepare our congregations and work with our community members to, to have a serious public conversation around reparations. And those churches are in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Charleston, South Carolina, and Washington, D.C. So it's not, you know, it's not like Burlington, Vermont, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like, a, it's, it's not, like, it's not like lefty world that this is happening. It's happening in these, in these communities. So I, I think it's going to be complex, but I'm excited and, and actually hopeful of this. I think you started to answer a little bit of this and that, that follow-up um but i was struck by the emphasis between like the the personal like personal responsibility versus the corporate or cultural or, or or broader responsibility as well and i'm kind of curious as to you know like, like I, def I definitely get a sense of like there's the, it, it can be easily politicized like in terms of like well this doesn't belong to my camp of it's, you know it's, it's easy with the polarization we've got in, in politics, it's it's easy to say, okay, well, this doesn't this doesn't match with my version of politics or something like that. Um, but do you see a way that kind of cuts across um, what what can at least traditional American politics, which are emphasized so strongly? Um, mm -hmm. Like like I, I think of I've, I've got family. Some of my family is you know super excited about the current administration. Some of my family is very disappointed about the the, the switch and, and all that. And how they all they're all professing christians at least mo most of them are um but how do i how do i have that conversation with those who would feel like this is this is a leftist thing or this is you know this is like like they would categorically reject it um and then and then also how do you how do you build that that true like <laughs> It, yes, there's an individual aspect. Also, how do you build that community uh, responsibility for, for for that as well? That, that, I think it's. I think. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I just to say that they can span the politics. <laughs> well, I think this is a really. It's a great question. It's an important thing, and it was actually really animating for the strategy for this book. Um, my instinct has been that national politics it, politics is essentially setting the discursive terms for how we all relate to each other and I think that that's a, that's that's profoundly destructive and so we essentially took a more community oriented approach in this book I don't talk about the federal government one time or national politics or politics at all one time apart from either telling historical stories apart from the introduction when I just say this is not a book about that and what we did is we tried to, reframe the whole conversation, not by getting Christians into a conversation that to which many are inherently hostile for all kinds of political and ideological reasons, but to try to build a case from within our own tradition that said, and honestly, a lot of the folks that we quoted in the Zacchaeus chapter, which is chapter five about restitution and the Samaritan chapter, which is chapter six about restoration, 
they're from the reform tradition. Okay. And the reason we're doing that is these Puritans were no joke about restitution. It was like, if your great granddaddy took something from somebody and you got it, you give it back. If you gained a house from the wealth of that, you need to, I mean, they're like talk now they're not applying it to slavery, but they are applying it to all kinds of other things. And so I think that there's a very strong Christian ethical tradition and that we tried to frame it in that way. Um, and I think by making it not merely economic, which actually is the, um, has been one of the key horizons of, of disagreement because this feels like, it feels like an attack on capitalism or something. It gets, it gets pulled into this like historic debate around liberalism, capitalism, and, and other forms of accountability um, and regulation. And so I don't, I'm not naive enough to think we're going to pull out of that riptide, but I think by saying, okay, we're not going to put it against the backdrop of national politics because that is like toxic, but against communities. We're not going to put it fundamentally against the backdrop of um, international debates about uh, redress, although those are super important and we refer to those, but we're going to put it around against the backdrop of very clear history and very clear Christian ethical tradition. Um, and then we're going to suggest some things that people can do at the local level so that people don't feel disempowered. I think I've, I've been surprised. I mean, that my one of the first people who reached out to me about this book was a guy whose family owns a, a beach house on property that was stolen from African-Americans. It's been in his family for three generations. He went to the University of South Carolina. He was a KA where they had to pledge allegiance like to Robert E. Lee or something. And he, uh, he, he I, not exactly that, but he, he told me something like that late. Um, and he, he asked me to come down and visit him and we went on a walk and he was like, I can't believe this. I didn't know any of this. I'm re how can we get reparations done in Columbia, South Carolina at First Presbyterian Church? And I, I, um, I, I think that that encouraged me that framing it in those ways bypassed some of the typical defenses, not all of them, but I, I think that that was the only thing I knew how to do. Because I think if we can work this out locally, just work it out locally in partnerships, um, that eventually when we will, I think that's going to be a, we're going to create a paradigm for what it could look like across the country. That's what I think could happen. Hey, Gregory, this is Foxy. I am not on camera because it's not the day for that yet. But All right. <laughs> hi, Grace. Um, I have a question in regards to uh, intriguing to think about debt cancellation in regards to like school loans. Uh, I heard you say uh, subsidizing mortgage payments for folks, um, maybe even one thought was about doing down payments for home ownership. Can you tell me, have you seen a church kind of take that in and what were the kind of barriers that got in the way? Because to me in my head, it's just like, well, just make a budget for supporting people locally to get this done. But what have you seen get in the way of a church just making that happen? Um, so I don't have tons of examples of churches doing things like that um, at least, and, and referring to it as reparations. Some people have said, how is this different than community development? Um, and I think part of what we're saying is we're trying to consciously articulate this as a response to an act of cultural theft. Um, and so I haven't seen a lot of churches doing that. Um, I think that the things that get in the way are the things that you would imagine, you know, not being comfortable talking about white supremacy, not wanting to, you know, talk about redress. I think that there are people are worried about creating a sense of entitlement. People are worried about paternalism. Those are the, the kind of obstacles. Um, People, and also uh, folks in the, in the quote, broadly conceived white community or non-black community that have more privilege are often concerned about doing something wrong. Um, and so there's a, there's a type of paralysis that happens there. Um, but I think this feels to me to be very doable. One of the things I think this should happen is that um, churches ought to find out who's doing this kind of work in their community and figure out how to how to really invest and support that work because I think that that um, one of the biggest obstacles that I see is churches acting unilaterally and not in collaboration and deciding what they're going to do rather than letting the black community tell them what they need. Um, and so I think uh, that one of the biggest issues is that lots of churches don't have strong relationships in the African American communities, and so they end up just doing unilateral stuff, and then somebody calls them on it and they get their feelings hurt, and then they retreat and they decide not you know it's too divisive or something. So I think a slow, patient work of partnership and building, like this dude is building reparations now 
Northwest Arkansas. That's the organization he started. But his his work is to basically build all these partnerships between churches, African American leaders, and and really slowly, slowly um, build a context in which people can trust each other enough to talk about this. So I th- those are some of the things that I'm seeing. But I don't have a lot of great great models. I do, however, in chapter seven, point to people who who are I think the leaders in this work, and with the hope that you can look them up and and have and call them and and they're black leaders. I basically try to, at the end of chapter, in chapter seven to say, this is where my constructive support ends. And now we're going to listen to black voices and they're going to tell us what they need. And that's what chapter seven is all about. We have a couple minutes remaining for questions. Anyone out there who uh, has a thought or a question you'd like to share? I, I really am um, looking forward to reading your book. And I'm just emotional about this invitation to the Samaritan and Zacchaeus. I think it's really um, Holy Spirit led. Thank you, Greg. Because I think that is one of the barriers that I have had with friends um, is that sense of they aren't personally responsible and I loved how you broke that down because I Jesus is my king you know I mean he is lord of all and he died and he modeled what does it look like to take on sin and what does it look like to have a responsibility as a Christian for someone else's sin. And I just, I think I'm emotional because I feel really humbled by that invitation to say, I am a sin eater, right? Like Jesus calls me to repair what I am not even responsible for as his disciple. And I just, I think it's gonna be something that really is gonna shape me for the rest of my life, not just about this calling. Um, but I just feel really quickened in my spirit to really meditate on what does it mean to really be a Samaritan and what does it mean to really model Zacchaeus. Um, so thank you. Oh yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. I mean, I think one of the things that I've heard is that this and this conversation, this I could have said this earlier in this when the, the obstacles is that people the the kind of con- quote conservative evangelical world has had so much emphasis on personal responsibility um, of a certain kind um, with respect to our politics, you know, um, especially in the 80s and 90s, that was such a huge emphasis um, and not wanting to, to, to cultivate victimization or entitlement or anything like that, that we actually have neglected this thing that we we are not just here to take responsibility for our actions, or but also for the wounds of this world. <laughs> and, 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 and one of the things about the question about why I'm not responsible for this, I, my, my, I mean, if I hear my people didn't even own slaves one more freaking time, I would say, what? Well, it's not the point. When you go to as a missionary to Rwanda, do you say, my people weren't really involved in this genocide? So, no, you know what? That would make you a terrible freaking missionary. Because what you are or are not responsible for as a, as a matter, of your, matter of your own personal ethical autobiography is in no way the question. The question is, what do your neighbors need? And what has happened in this world that you as a missionary Christian are called to address? That's the that's the question. And I think that that this idea of like ethical motivations largely being self-referential is absurd. But that's something that's been imported from like from political culture, really from the Reagan era forward. And I think that's like super important that we recognize that that is an obstacle and that and that the Good Samaritan, which is the story that Jesus used to tell us what love is does not have that ethic in it anywhere at all, like none. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Greg, for being with us this morning and for sharing out of your expertise and sharing your your book with us. I think many of us will be looking forward to that. Um, And I'm so grateful to be connected uh, here virtually. And thank you all for showing up today. 
Uh, I just want to take a few moments to uh, talk about two weeks from now, we'll be meeting again, and I'm really excited about this. It's actually going to be a conversation um, between Pastor Jason and Taylor Greer, who is a director of worship and ministry of racial justice and reconciliation at another local church, who I'm sure you're familiar with, Bethany Community Church. Uh, and they're going to discuss about how to create safe spaces for these dialogues around race uh, in a polarizing time, how to foster vulnerability and conversations uh, effectively in our communities. So we're looking forward to that, and I would really love it if all of you would show up in two weeks. So thank you all. Uh, blessings this Sunday, and I hope to see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Great to see you all.